In this screencast, I want to cover the basic counting principles. These principles have a wide range of applicability and we'll see how they're used over the next few classes um, in many different situations. So why are they important? Well, in computing we need to count the number of instructions and the size of problems so that we can analyze and compare the performance of different algorithms. That's really the key application. Another application that crops up a lot, generally it's a little simpler to analyze, is determine the size of the address space or the namespace that's needed for identification or authentication of a system. Um, you can think of just telephone numbers, for example, as a simple example of a quote-unquote address space that's been around for a long time and is served pretty well. Um, we haven't really had to change that for a long time. Uh, finally, the other thing, applications that it commonly comes up with is determining the probability of different outcomes and determining how many people you need to sample um, for a given survey to get validity. And you'll cover that more in your probability statistics course. So the first basic counting principle is the product rule. And we've been using this informally in class all along. Basically, the product rule says that if a task can be performed in m ways and another independent task can be performed in n ways, then the combination of doing both tasks, so both task 1 and task 2, can be performed in the product m times n ways. The set theoretic version of the product rule, which we've also talked about, is if we look at the Cartesian product of two sets, remember that's the set of ordered pairs where the first entry in the ordered pair comes from A and the second entry comes from B, uh, then the cardinality of the Cartesian product A cross B is equal to the cardinality of A times the cardinality of B. And more generally, although we haven't really talked about this, you can take the cross product, the Cartesian product of a number, any number of sets, and then its cardinality will just be the product of the cardinalities of each of the individual sets. <clears throat> the version of the product rule that you'll be using most often um, in the next few years of your computer science curriculum is sort of this programming version of it. Namely, if you have a statement that's executing inside a nested loop and the outer loop iterates n times and the inner loop iterates m times, then that statement will be executed n times m times. So some examples of the product rule. And again, you've seen some of these. Um, how many bit strings, strings of just zeros and ones, of length n are there? Well, you have two choices for the first entry in the bit string, two choices for the second entry, two choices for the last entry. So since there's n entries, two to the n choices. Another example that's very common in terms of trying to determine, say, the number of passwords and the number of identifiers for a system is where the characters can come from a wider set. So I'll take a simple example here. We'll just say that there are, the characters could come from A, B, C, D, and E, and how many strings of length 3 can be formed. There's really two situations that come up a lot. One is repetitions are allowed. The other is repetitions are not allowed. If the repetitions are allowed, it's just 5 times 5 times 5. Because at any step, you could choose any of the elements of the set. If no repetitions are allowed, then you have to take into account the, repetition, the element that you chose at the first step. So in the first step, you have 5. You can choose any of the 5 elements. But at the second step, you can only choose 4 because you've used up one of, the, one of them in the first step. And in the third step, you can only choose three. This is uh, important to really get straight in your mind uh, because we'll be coming back to this and using this basic idea many, many times in the next couple weeks. Finally, the programming version of this is how many times is a statement executed inside nested loops? And here's an example, really simple, silly, kind of silly example, but... We've got at the outer loop, i goes from 1 to 12, and inner loop, j goes from 1 to 15. So for each i, this inner loop is going to get executed 15 times. And so how many i's are there? There are 12 i's. So 12 times 15 
is equal to 180. The sum rule is the other basic principle, and again, we've been using this informally all along. Um, the statement, you'll see it worded differently in different textbooks, uh, but basically if you have a, a one task or one choice that, that can be done in m ways and another one that can be done in n plus 1 ways, then perf the number of choices, if you can only perform one of those two tasks that you have is m plus n. From a set perspective, uh, basically, again, we've seen this. If the two, if the intersection between two sets is the, equal to the empty set, then A union B, the number of choices that you have of choosing either something from A or something from B, is the number of choices from A plus the number of choices of B. So, some simple examples of the sum rule. Um, a student goes to a restaurant, they have seven meat dishes, six vegetarian dishes. How many options do they have to order only one dish? Well, that's pretty straightforward, right? Obviously, these don't overlap in any way. Um, and if they're only going to offer order one dish, they either order a meat dish, and they have, or they have seven choices, or a vegetarian dish where they have six choices. An equally simple example is how many times you can print will hello be printed in sequential loops like this one. So we go through the first loop 12 times printing hello each time then we go through the second loop 15 times printing hello each time so it's just 12 plus 15 or 27. So the final basic principle I want to cover is the principle of inclusion exclusion and we've talked about this in class um, but I don't want to go through it again because it's so important. This is a generalization of the sum rule and if you remember the cardinality of A union B is equal to the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B minus the cardinality of A intersection B. The point being that the elements in A intersection B are being double counted when because we count them both when we count the cardinality of A and when we count the cardinality of B. So here's a good example that illustrates this. How many bit strings of length 6 either start with a 0 or end with 1, 1? Well, we're going to let A be the set of bit strings that start with 0. So since they start with 0, we only can choose whether the, each of the five entries, remaining entries, are 0 or 1. So the cardinality of A is going to be equal to 2 to the fifth by the product rule. Similarly, B, the bit strings of length 6 that end with 1, 1, B is going to, the cardinality of B is going to be equal to 2 to the 4th because we only can decide on the first four bits whether they're 0 or 1, and we have two choices for each one of those. Then the bit strings that we're double counting, A intersection B, are those that begin both with a 0 and end with a 1, 1. And I think that's pretty easy to see. Um, if you're having trouble... <coughs> Excuse me, if you're having trouble, just write down some of those examples. And again, the cardinality of A intersection B is going to be equal to 2 cubed because there are exactly three bits that are free bits that we get to choose whether they're going to be 0 or 1. Thus, the cardinality of A union B is going to be 2 to the 5th cardinality of A plus 2 to the 4th cardinality of B minus 2 cubed which is the cardinality of A intersection B, which are those strings that we're double counting. So that's going to be 32 plus 16 minus 8, which is 40. At this point, you should be able to do all the examples on this practice page. Make sure you can do them all, and that should get you well prepared for class. And it's a good review for what you've just learned in the previous, on the previous slides and in this screencast.